Hello and welcome to today's webinar. It is currently midnight here in Australia where I am and we are joined by participants from around the globe. My name is Edlyn Gurney and I'm an advisor at the Global CS Institute and I will be your host for today. The topic of today's webinar is on lessons learned from CO2 pipeline infrastructure. This webinar will be presented by Frank Fiesma from Ecofis, who I will introduce further in just a moment. This presentation is based on a report called CO2 Pipeline Infrastructure that was commissioned by the IEA GHG um, on behalf of the Global CCS Institute. The purpose of this study was to take advantage of public domain information on CO2 pipelines and put this information into a comprehensive reference document and in doing so assist project developers, decision makers and regulators. To complete this study, Ecofis partners partnered with SNC Lavalin in Canada. The full report and database is currently available on the Institute's website um, under the Publications tab. On the Publications page you can also find a link to the online database of CO2 pipelines. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available on the Institute's website in a few days' time as well as the slide pack separately. Now, in terms of how the webinar will work today, after I introduce Frank, we'll commence the presentation. At any time during the presentation, you may submit questions through the box on your screen, as shown in my presentation here. You should have your own box on your screen. And then I will collate your questions following the presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session where I will direct your questions to the panel. For this part of the webinar, will be joined by Doug McDonald from SNC Lavalin in Canada and also from um, Paul Notout from Ecofis in the Netherlands. Frank today is also joining us um, from the Netherlands where he works as a unit manager for conventional energy systems at Ecofis. Frank has over 15 years experience in energy and infrastructure sectors. He has worked on ports and coastal protection works, LNG production facilities, refineries and offshore wind projects. Frank's involvement includes all project phases from feasibility studies, design, construction to operation and maintenance. He's carried out assignments in the US, Russia, China, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Frank holds a master's degree in civil engineering and a bachelor's in economics. I would now like to welcome Frank to start his presentation. Over to you, Frank. Yes, Ellen, thank you for your, uh, uh, your introduction. I'd like to thank uh, you and the Global CCS Institute uh, for the opportunity here to, uh, uh, to present uh, our, the results of our, of our study. Um, we have um, uh, worked on this for the last uh, three quarters of a year and I think uh, yeah, brought together a quite comprehensive set of, uh, of information on these uh, CO2 pipeline infrastructures and I'm happy in this webinar to give you a first glimpse, uh, a glimpse of that and hopefully uh, as an introduction and uh, uh, for you to uh, further review the, the detailed information that, as Edlin said, is, is available on the, uh, uh, on the Global CCS Institute's website. Um, so I'll take the next 25-30 uh, uh, minutes to, uh, uh, to show you an overview of our study. Uh, I'll talk shortly about background and scope, uh, then how we approach this. Uh, and then show you some, some first impressions of the, the outcomes, the database, uh, as well as the reference manual document. And I'll, I'll wrap up with some, uh, some of the main findings and, and conclusions. Um, so a key uh, realization is that uh, uh, the Global CCSI and IEA GIG had was CO2 pipelines are nothing new. There are numerous operational CO2 pipelines uh, uh, in the world. Uh, with the total length exceeding uh, 6,000 uh, kilometers. Many of those are, are in the Americas and have been operating for, uh, for decades. Uh, in most cases that had to do with uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, operations where CO2 from natural occurrences, uh, in some cases quite significant distances away, uh, were transported by these pipelines to, uh, 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 to be used in, in EOR operations. And from those existing projects there, there really is a wealth of uh, of information available uh, that has, and those are uh, available in, in articles, reports about specific uh, projects, uh, also from the EOR uh, community, uh, 
wealth of information, particularly when those operations started in the, uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, and from that time onward. Uh, but not only in those in those documents, also among owners, businesses, and the companies uh, operating uh, and developing these projects. Um, so there's numerous lessons learned here, and and those are valuable for uh, for CCS uh, projects, where also CO2 pipelines uh, tend to be an important part of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the overall project. Um, however. Uh, Let's say it's uh, not always the case that uh, uh, the CCS project developers have the first-hand uh, knowledge of all that ex all those existing CO2 pipeline projects. So this is where our project comes in, uh, capturing lessons learned from those uh, from those existing projects, uh, covering a range of themes, the entire project life cycle, uh, and also pipelines in different uh, physical environments, uh, and making that information accessible to to the CCS uh, community. Um, so this is the those are the the objectives of of our project. Um, so we've been looking at CO2 pipelines from from around the world. I mentioned that a significant share of the the over 6,000 kilometers are in the Americans Americas, uh, but there's also pipelines in numerous pipelines in other parts of the world. Um, so that includes a significant number of existing pipelines with uh, operational history and track record. Also, some pipelines in, in advanced planning uh, planning stages. So, in our work, we've been, been focused on so those things that are specific or particular to, to CO2 pipelines. Um, it's clear that for, for gas pipelines in general, uh, there's a lot of parallels, let's say, with, with natural gas pipelines. Um, and we've not dived into everything that, that has to do with uh, uh, the development or, or design of, of gas pipelines. Um, we've been based, basing ourselves of, of public information, uh, but you'll see in a minute that that included uh, literature documents, but we certainly did an extensive uh, round of interviews as well to, to expand, let's say, that body of, of public information. And we've been working hard to making these results very accessible uh, uh, to you, to the audience, and, and anybody who's, uh, who's interested. Uh, we've built compiled the information collected in a, in a database. I'll show you a glimpse of that in, in a minute. Um, that's, uh, let's say, a, a mother document, but it also has a, a web interface added to that uh, to, to give you quick uh, access, let's say, to that information and a convenient way of, of viewing those. Um, secondly, there's a, a reference manual document uh, that builds on that database, complements it, draws uh, conclusions, uh, uh, main lessons learned and give some some guidance on on the development of such CO2 uh, pipelines. And thirdly, uh, this webinar today serves also to uh, to make those those results available. So, how have we approached this uh, this question? I mentioned there's uh, over 80 CO2 pipelines uh, uh, existing that we know of. We have selected a, a sizable subset of those, uh, arriving at a final number of 29. Uh, let's say realizing that uh, trying to capture all 80 is probably beyond the scope of uh, of, of the objectives. Let's say uh, at the same time trying to identify those pipelines where there's uh, interesting lessons learned and, and uh, good opportunities. Let's say to to collect uh, relevant information and approach the parties uh, parties involved uh, while making sure we cover uh, a wide range of, of Types of types of physical environments and, and parts of the world. Uh, we've done extensive work on, on developing a checklist for those data elements that we uh, we would like to cover, um, and and those included, let's say, the physical char characteristics of the infrastructure, uh, not only the design and, and planning stages, but also operation and maintenance, looking at risk and safety aspects as well as, as regulatory regime. The next step, we've embarked on a quite comprehensive literature uh, review where we've used a wide range of uh, uh, types of sources, uh, ranging from, from journal articles to, to detailed feed studies from, uh, on these projects, as well as environmental impact assessment uh, studies. Um, and as we were doing that, we've started complementing the literature, information from the literature, through a, a significant number of, of interviews. 
uh, approaching pipeline owners, operators, uh, designers, and builders to uh, uh, yeah to get one-on-one -on -one information uh, from them, and in particular focused at uh, yeah filling gaps uh, or, or information that we have not yet identified in the literature, as well as verifying uh, verifying that information. So we organize that information in a database uh, and, and subsequently been, been analyzing this and drawing conclusions uh, and capture those in, in the reference manual document. So I'll show you a quick glimpse of the, the 29 uh, pipelines that we've, been, uh, that we've covered. Uh, you'll see it covers different parts uh, of the world. Uh, it includes pipelines, numerous pipelines that have been operational for significant periods of time. Uh, in particular uh, in the US, uh, and also a number of pipelines that are in advanced planning stages, and a few that, that have reached very advanced planning stages but were, were cancelled in the end, uh, but nonetheless included those because uh, it provided value insight in how, uh, what the track record that exists in Europe, um, and uh, in, in a number of those cases there was very good information available with valuable lessons learned. Uh, for all the stages that the project did go through. Um, so we, we've done comprehensive work on, on data gathering. We also encountered uh, some challenges uh, in that. Uh, data availability varied from project uh, to project. Uh, in some cases, there was very good information available for, for the oldest projects when CO2 pipelines were st still new in the, the 90, late 1970s and 1980s. Um, but that, on the other hand, in some cases that, that involved hard copy documents that were then again uh, harder to, uh, to access. Um, for currently operational projects, obviously we also encountered uh, yeah, limits to the willingness to share information where this was considered commercially uh, relevant. Um, and uh, in other cases, I mentioned projects that are in advanced planning stages, some C2 pipeline projects associated with uh, CCS projects in, in the UK, um, where there's still a, a competition for grants among those projects where that also imposed yeah, limitations on, on uh, the parties involved a willing willingness to share. Um, but on the other hand, some projects that had recently been cancelled, again, there was uh, very detailed information that uh, that could be accessed. Um, and there were also some particular topics that proved uh, difficult to, uh, 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 to get detailed information on, and in particular that uh, related to cost and, and detailed information on the auxiliary equipment that, uh, that is tied to, uh, to the pipeline. So this then brings me to uh, giving you a, a first quick glimpse of this, uh, uh, this database. What you see on the screen now is, uh, is more or less a table of contents of uh, the database. On the horizontal axis, more or less compressed, is the list of, uh, of projects uh, considered. Um, and on the vertical axis, uh, the data elements covered. And you see in green here the, the main headers of the, the data elements that were, uh, uh, were collected, uh, starting from, from the general physical characteristics, uh, all the way through uh, risks and safety aspect, regulatory regime, public concern, etc. Now these are just the main headers. You'll see in, by the row numbers there that those add up to uh, beyond 135. So uh, under each of these sections, there's uh, numerous uh, sub data elements that capture, uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's say, different features of uh, uh, of, of the pipelines. Um, so if you imagine multiplying the number of columns with the numbers of, of rows here, uh, you'll you get an impression of the, the overall size of the database, which is quite impressive. Just to, to show you an example of, uh, for one of those projects, I've copied some detailed information from, the, uh, from some rows uh, from the Cortez pipeline in, uh, in the US. Uh, on the left, a couple of uh, rows from the, the physical characteristics uh, section. Uh, that basically says where that uh, uh, the overall length of pipeline, the, the infrastructure crossings that are involved, the uh, basic material specs, uh, basic approach to corrosion inhibition uh, and protection. Uh, and then on the right bottom section, uh, again, a detailed copy but from a different part of, uh, of the data element for the Cortez pipeline that relates to operation and maintenance. 
uh, we've worked hard to uh, to fill all data fields in some cases uh, not so much here uh, well, at the right bottom you see an element saying no no remarks that also occurs in case there's there's none uh, we've been very meticulous in making sure that each data element has uh, the, the references used uh, specified to that also for the user of the, the database to uh, uh, had to provide him or her handles for further diving into this uh, subject and finding even more detailed information uh, uh, that may be relevant to uh, to him or her. Um, we'll see that the actual database is a is a big Excel uh, spreadsheet that can be uh, navigated quite uh, conveniently. Uh, and as Adlan said, you'll, you should be able to have convenient access through that, to that through the uh, uh, Global CCS Institute's uh, website. So on top of this, we've, uh, we've built uh, uh, a web viewer to, to provide some convenient access to this database. You'll get a first impression here. Uh, you start out with a, uh, a global map where these, all these pipelines are, are basically plotted as dots. But this allows you to, to zoom in uh, to specific pipelines uh, at the right bottom, a picture, and a picture here where you, you get to see the actual outline uh, and, and length of, uh, of this pipeline plotted. In some cases, uh, some networks of, of pipelines with some different branches, as you see at the right bottom. Um, and by clicking on those, uh, those elements, you're, you get a, a little pop-up window that shows uh, uh, a sizable subset of all the data elements from the uh, from the database in uh, uh, yeah in, in a text box let's say so on top of this uh, uh, this database we've been constructing uh, a reference document manual the purpose of this was to be a document that, that complements a database and and provides a guide to uh, uh, to accessing the database uh, highlighting relevant examples and, and showing where further information can be found. Uh, it, it does cover the main building blocks of CO2 pipelines and, and tries to highlight the issues that a, a proponent or regulator will want to consider uh, when uh, wanting to develop CO2 pipeline projects. Uh, and yes, it, it highlights key, uh, uh, key learnings from the different phases in these, uh, these projects. Now we've written that document uh, and, and compiled the database as well for target audience that consists of, on the one hand, project developers that are interested in, in building these CO2 pipeline projects, possibly in relation to, to CCS projects, uh, but who do, do not have in-house the, the, uh, yet the, the detailed engineering or cost, uh, cost estimating expertise, uh, but also governments and, and regulators that have to address different phases of CO2 pipeline uh, projects. And, and having to, to look at permitting and, and the regulatory uh, regulating questions. Um, so in some sense, the, the reference manual aims at providing an overview and, and, and uh, if you want to take one step further in detail, there's the, uh, the database to, uh, to refer to. Um, still, if you are already uh, in the CO2 pipeline business as a, as a designer or a constructor or a developer, specialist developer, uh, Possibly this manual uh, gives you an interesting overview, um, but we'll also talk about things, uh, a number of things that you, you may already be aware of. Um, so this uh, just shows the, the title page, page of the uh, reference manual uh, and gives you a, a first impression of what the document looked like. Uh, it consists of three main sections. The first section talks about uh, captures lessons learned from these existing projects basically uh, starting from the database and, and uh, uh, looking at parallels, interesting examples uh, on these, uh, from the, the information that we captured from all these different projects. Uh, second section B, uh, we've translated those, uh, those lessons and, and shaped that into a, a guideline for assessment of CO2 pipeline projects. Um, an assessment you, you have to imagine uh, both when it comes to uh, 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 for project developers let's say uh, but also we mentioned uh, governments and, and regulators um, and then there's a final section C uh, that talks about overall findings and conclusions uh, uh, from all the information gathered and the lessons learned 
Um, and in the latter part of my presentation, I'll, I'll quickly uh, flag some of those uh, uh, those findings and conclusions uh, to give you an impression of what we what we've uh, we've found. Um, uh, that summary of findings and conclusions will just uh, will not touch on everything. I'm just uh, I'm just just highlighting a few interesting uh, themes, topic areas that we've encountered. And the first one among those is uh, where this relates to public concern about CO2 pipelines. Uh, it was clear that uh, three uh, there are three main drivers, let's say, of, uh, of, of public concern when it comes to these pipelines. Firstly, there is a degree of unfamiliar unfamiliarity, excuse me, uh, among public but also regulatory uh, bodies uh, with these CO2 pipelines. Um, particularly where those projects will be first of a kind. Obviously, in, in some areas in the U.S. where there's many kilometers of these pipelines existing, um, well, we're, we're, we step beyond that, uh, but it, it will play a role in areas where those will be first of a kind. Secondly, uh, there's risks that are, have, that are perceived uh, with, uh, associated with CO2 storage. But those are not separated in the public mind from, from those specifically related to the CO2 pipelines. And so that's something that, that needs, to be, uh, needs to be addressed whenever uh, uh, considering CO2 pipeline projects. And the third element here is that regulatory framework and design standards are uh, not as well developed for CO2 pipelines, uh, or at least less mature than they are for, for natural gas pipelines. So there are three key factors that, that play a role in, in how uh, public concern uh, uh, looks at or relates to uh, CO2 pipelines. Um, and that we've seen some examples in, in the project considered where the public concern that occurred at the time of, of development related not so much to, to the pipeline itself, um, but, but more the, uh, uh, the bigger overall uh, project, either related to a power plant or CO2 storage uh, project that the pipeline is, re is related to. Um, because the pipeline themselves uh, have not been considered if, uh, much differently than other uh, other pipeline uh, projects. So, second uh, topic area I wanted to uh, to bring up uh, in, uh, in terms of key findings and conclusions relate to permitting and regulation. Uh, for most pipelines, environmental assessments have been prepared. Interestingly, for only uh, a few of the project considerations, those were strictly mandatory for the pipeline itself. Uh, mostly these were done voluntarily or uh, because the project was part of a, of a bigger EOR or CCS uh, uh, project. Excuse me, the pipeline was part of a bigger uh, EOR or CCS project and was thus considered part of, uh, part of the package uh, uh, that the environmental impact assessment uh, related to. Um, when it comes to, to regulations, uh, well, there's, let's say, the very rel interesting information and relevant uh, track record there in, in the U.S. Uh, the early pipelines, the first pipelines that, that uh, uh, were designed and built in the, the 1970s were uh, based on, on a natural gas pipeline uh, regulatory regime in the absence of specific design codes or standards for, for CO2 pipelines. By 1989, uh, uh, specific regulation for CO2 pipelines were introduced and interestingly the, these were not driven by, by safety record because that was good and still is good in, in the US um, but it was more due to a realization that uh, well high consequent incidents may occur uh, if, if a CO2 pipeline or an element of that were to fail uh, and of course there are some uh, uh, some things that are specific and, and particular to CO2 pipelines, so better make sure that those are adequately addressed in the, uh, uh, the governing regulations. Um, in the EU, the, uh, the CCS directive uh, is one of the main uh, had the relevant uh, types of project that the CO2 pipelines would relate to at the moment. Uh, but that directive points to that the, the current framework for natural gas transfer pipeline uh, uh, regulation would be adequate to regulate uh, CO2 transport. So that is at a uh, yeah. So the regulatory framework there is less uh, less specific uh, and maybe less uh, uh, yeah uh, maturely developed towards specific 
uh, topics deemed relevant to C2 pipelines as, as in the US, and they're, they're relevant, uh, uh, there may be relevant lessons learned in, in, in that. So next I'll mention a few uh, topics on, on planning and design. Uh, interestingly, in the, uh, in the EOR operations uh, in the US and the CO2 pipelines have been built associated with that. Uh, that has also been done in, in consortia, groupings of companies that have joined forces uh, to, uh, on the one hand, yeah, produce commercially viable projects uh, by the extra revenues uh, generated from the extra oil uh, produced. Uh, and those are consortia of maybe pipeline developers, parties working on the EOR uh, operation, uh, oil production operations, and maybe parties that, that had CO2 uh, uh, available. Uh, and there's some interesting examples that the, the database shows and through the reference manual discusses, where there's, there's been multiple CO2 sources and sinks, and over time uh, a collection transmission distri distribution network has, uh, has developed uh, with numerous numerous branches that uh, uh, and growing capacity, let's say, that has developed uh, over time. Um, well, we've uh, we've seen a number of uh, uh, a broad range of, of let's say basic specifications of pipelines. Just to give you a, a glimpse of some captured little table here that for uh, a subset of parameters ranging from from length to uh, diameters and wall thicknesses, operating pressures. Uh, shows gives an impression of the range of low, medium, and high values. Uh, that's for each of those parameters uh, uh, separately, uh, and it shows that uh, in some cases, or there, there's quite a wide range of uh, of types of pipelines, from very modest length to uh, to many hundreds of kilometers, uh, from uh, low operating pressures to to quite high uh, uh, operating pressures. Um, and so a wide, wide variety of pipelines, and in some cases it had to do with the, uh, well, the different ways in which these pipelines uh, uh, were developed over time, uh, and their, their, let's say, personal histories in some cases where this relate to a, a growing network of pipelines, as I mentioned uh, before, in some cases where uh, old existing pipelines for either natural gas or, uh, or, or liquid fuels transportation uh, were reused to become CO2 transport pipelines, um, uh, and in some cases, obviously, uh, uh, dedicated CO2 pipelines that were developed for a specific uh, specific project. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, corrosion as a specific risk when it comes to CO2 pipelines, uh, uh, particularly where uh, uh, the combination of CO2 and water is uh, poses a, a, a hazard. Uh, this has led to extensive use of dehydration systems in, in these pipelines and this protection measures uh, uh, as well as an inspection regime. Uh, well, let's say in, in concept not much different as used for other pi uh, natural gas pipelines, other gas pipelines, uh, but still uh, with, with uh, specs, let's say, built on the, uh, or to address the specific hazards uh, to CO2 pipeline. Uh, it also led to uh, yes, establishing clear norms for water content that can be uh, can be accepted in these pipelines, uh, as well as water content monitoring. Although that has been a, a, an unreliable uh, uh, part of the uh, part of the project in many cases, and and that fact has led that uh, general uh, uh, objective has been to keep water content as low as possible in these projects. Of course, uh, this is between. Uh, between quotes as low as possible, because we still, uh, interestingly, have seen in the, the actual projects encountered quite a broad range of water content uh, values, from as low as uh, 50 ppm for, for some projects to as high as uh, 630 for, uh, for a number of others. Uh, and then just for reference, we've indicated that uh, approximately 840 ppm is a, is a limit that will be theoretically tolerable, tor tolerable excuse me. For, for carbon steel pipelines in, in, in conditions that are typical for, uh, for the U.S. Um, so another topic area I wanted to briefly touch on was uh, safety statistics. Uh, from the information we have uh, we've brought together, uh, it's clear that incidents for CO2 pipelines are, are rare, and whenever something has happened, uh, these have been less severe than those with uh, 
with natural gas uh, systems. Um, from the little statistical data we, we have, that there, there's no indication that the frequency of incidents would be significantly different from, from what's observed in natural gas pipelines. But of course, there, there's limited information. There's much fewer kilometers of these pipelines, and, and only well, it's, it's uh, more than 30 decades, or sorry, more than three decades, uh, but still a uh, smaller number of years than uh, the track record uh, of natural gas pipelines. So that limits the robustness of, uh, of conclusions uh, that can be drawn. Um, there's inter interesting uh, data on incidents available from the Records Office of, of Pipeline Safety uh, in the U.S. covering that a period of 1972 to, to 2012. Uh, over that entire period, there's no known reports of uh, civilian in injuries or, or casualties uh, with these CO2 pipelines. Uh, there are a number of reported incidents, however, uh, that relate to uh, uh, relief valve failure, failure and some, uh, some release of uh, CO2 as a consequence. Uh, other uh, valve packing or welds or gasket failures uh, some incidents uh, have to do with uh, with corrosion as well or, or outside forces damaging the pipelines. Uh, for the existing, few existing pipelines in Europe, we have found a little anecdotal evidence on, on a very small number of, of very small scale uh, incidents. Um, again, no personal injuries, injuries or, or casualties. It's also clear that in Europe uh, there, there's not yet uh, a framework, let's say, for systematically correct, uh, collecting data on uh, on such incident, incidents uh, that will be uh, comparable, let's say, with this uh, record office of pipeline safety work in, in the U.S. Well, and then my final slide on, on key findings and conclusions uh, on operational reliability uh, from the, the pipeline project have been uh, operating for a number of years. The, the information we got from there it's points uh, or suggests that these pipelines have been able to, to accommodate and flexibly handle the, the operational needs of both sources and, and sinks or destinations, uh, and also in the cases where this uh, was part of a, of a network with some different branches of these pipelines. Um, and when looking at the, uh, the bigger uh, projects, these pipelines have, tip have typically been among the most operational, operationally, operationally excuse me, reliable components of these, uh, these overall projects. So this brings me to the end of, uh, uh, of my introduction, and uh, I'd like to give the uh, hand word back to Adeline to moderate questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Frank. I'll now like to remind the listeners that um, there's the box on your screen if you wish to ask any further questions. But before we move on to the Q&A session, I'd like to introduce you a little bit further to the other members of the panel. We have Doug McDonald for, from SNC-Lavalin, Doug has more than 40 years experience in almost every aspect of the petroleum industry from exploration through to the gasoline pump. Over the past 15 years a large part of his work has involved studies for CO2 capture, transport and storage. In this area he's carried out assignments in Canada, Europe, the Middle East, China, Southeast Asia and Brazil. Doug holds a bachelor and master's degree in chemical engineering. Also we have Paul Notat from Ecofis. He joined Ecofis as a consultant in 2010 and has over five years of experience in studying low carbon technologies and renewable related energy topics. Paul is an experienced data analyst and data gathering expert and has been involved in several national and EU wide projects. For data gathering, uh, including data gathering, coordinating international data gathering and data process. And for this study, Paul was mainly involved in the data gathering and data management activities as well as writing the reference manual. Paul holds a bachelor's degree and master's degree in innovation studies. Okay, I'll just get to the first question. Um, we've got here a question, Frank, about uh, standardization of pipelines and of the CO2 pipelines. Do you think that this is an issue? Um, I'll give the example of when um, the case where several um, companies want to connect pipelines with each other. Um, yes, I think that's a that's an interesting topic, and I I think the uh, the most relevant experience with this and how that has uh, uh, evolved over time sometimes uh, uh, are are to be found in in, in the Americas. Uh, Doug, may I invite you to to comment on that uh, that question? Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Frank. Uh, yes, uh, the 
the standardization is required, uh, particularly in the circumstances mentioned by the questioner. Uh, the main issue is that uh, the CO2 pipeline then becomes like a common carrier, very similar to a gas pipeline. So there are, you're, sub you're subjected to uh, <clears throat> standardization of uh, inlet pressure, composition, uh, uh, particularly water content in the case of CO2. Uh, those are the main things, uh, and uh, it's, again, very, very similar to uh, what would happen in a natural gas system. So that standardization does have to occur, uh, perhaps uh, because CO2 is more specialized, uh, it may not be the universal on large scale standardization you may find uh, for gas pipelines where it's all the same pressure, uh, delivery point, and, uh, and so on. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, one of the other questions that we have was that um, concentrates on the 29 projects, and they just want to ask, were these projects the only ones you could find information on, or were they s selected for specific reasons, and maybe you could outline some of those? Yes. Um, well, they, they were selected for, for a combination of, uh, on, of, of criteria, let's say, based on the, taking the, the long list of projects that we had uh, versus a combination of criteria, where on the one hand, we, we wanted to make sure that we cover uh, yeah, a variety of projects uh, and a variety of, uh, of parts of the world and hence regulatory regimes uh, to provide a, a comprehensive overview of what, uh, uh, what lessons learned are available from different parts of the world and, and different different regimes, so different physical uh, circumstances of these pipelines. Uh, at the same time, we realized at the onset that it would be a challenge to uh, uh, to acquire uh, all data elements for all projects that we were looking for, and uh, given the uh, at the time frame available for this study, and also the resources that, uh, that could be committed, we had to prioritize and, and select uh, where uh, let's say based on the uh, the track record of uh, of uh, we here at ECOFIS and, and our colleagues, uh, Doug at SNC Levelins and his colleagues, uh, where we we yeah we had a good uh, best starting point let's say to, mm -hmm. to have any degree of confidence in in acquiring that data, um, and, uh, and so based on the long list we've at the onset made a, uh, an early selection as we proceeded we have uh, made some small adjustments to that list as well as we found that for some project it was more uh, harder than we expected in other projects it, it appeared uh, uh, we suddenly uh, had access to very good information um, so this was a balanced uh, <laughs> selection yeah. based on these criteria maybe Doug you could chip in as well based on your, your first hand uh, considerations in that respect in, in the Americas very little to add, uh, just that uh, CO2 pipeline technology is like any pipeline technology, or any type technology, it starts out as a novelty and there's a lot of information involved and then it kind of subsides into the commercial area and when it's in the commercial area there isn't a lot of information available uh, and uh, so that that influenced a fair bit what to what we did. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that uh, the presence of government or some form of public funding uh, uh, helps immeasurably in uh, sh information sharing. Mm. Yes, definitely it is important to share that information. Yeah. So uh, other than costs, which uh, that doesn't even seem to happen with a lot of, uh, of the ones where there is some public money input, uh, uh, it, it, it had a lot to do with... Uh, 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 availability of information. Yeah, great. Well, we've got quite a, a couple of technical questions here, so they might be um, for you, Doug. Um, could you comment on whether gaseous or dense flow is most common in the pipelines, and whether any pipelines could accept two-phase flow? Uh, dense phase flow is far and away the most uh, common. Uh, it, it is uh, almost universal for any long distance whatsoever uh, because the pipeline becomes too large if you're into what you call gaseous. Um, 
Uh, uh, I'm question, Evelyn. Uh, yeah, sorry, Doug, you just dropped out there just before you said because if the pipeline gets gaseous, it becomes it becomes too large for oh, the okay, amount yeah. of flow that goes through it. Okay. Oh, I know what the other part was. Uh, the other uh, boundary typically is that long distance pipelines are very much supercritical and short distance pipelines may not be. Uh, short distance being a, a couple of kilometers or uh, not much more than that. Hmm. Okay, and another one there is, um, is there any information on preferred methods of de-bottling, de-bottlenecking pipeline capacity? Now this person was particularly thinking of looping versus versus booster stations, and is there any chance change in preference for supercritical CO2 lines? Okay, I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to go back briefly to the previous question. Uh, Two-phase flow is very, very unlikely because the product becomes way too hard to either pump or compress. Now I'm going to turn to debottlenecking. What seems to be the practice from what we have seen, and I'm going to use Weyburn as a recent example, is uh, debottlenecking is done by designing the pipe uh, for perhaps twice the capacity, uh, eventual capacity, uh, uh, twice the capacity of what you're building it for in the first place, but only designing the pipe for that. So at least your first debottleneck uh, comes by putting in a booster station and perhaps even more than that. There, there, there certainly are considerations. Uh, the reference manual goes into some detail as to that and I would certainly suggest you, uh, you have a look at that, some of the decision making we can see that goes on in those circumstances. Uh, the considerations for CO2 are probably not that much different than the for a gas pipeline or an oil pipeline. Uh, uh, you take a look at the present situation and what you project and you make your best guess. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're really reluctant to tear the ground up any more often than you have to. Okay, um, and just one more, more technical question, then we've got another one here that's a more um, general question about pipeline development. Um, is there data on the oxygen content limitations for the CO2 required for acceptable pipeline operation? That's just starting to be uh, explored uh, from what we can see. Uh, there's, we didn't find a lot of data on it. Uh, generally, uh, the, the basics involve uh, keeping keeping the impurities, whether they be oxygen, nitrogen, or anything else, down to a point where there's no possibility of two-phase flow. Uh, and so oxygen content becomes a corrosivity issue. Uh, in the presence of water, it's a horrendous issue. Uh, without the water, it's not. So starting to be looked at, uh, however, again, the history of uh, pipelines over all these years uh, doesn't show big issues. Okay, and then bringing um, us more back to the part of the, C the pipelines as being part of the CCS chain, we often state that transport is the most mature part of the CCS chain, and this is perhaps um, by and large accepted. But what would you see to be the main challenges, such as what do we not know enough about yet? And did you find any new challenges in your study? Um, so maybe uh, I can take that uh, question. Um, well, we have, um, if, if you look at the overall findings I, I presented, I think one of the uh, topics mentioned was that uh, in terms of regulatory regime here, here in Europe, uh, there's not yet one that that caters specifically for CO2 pipelines. Um, also, there's not a specific uh, regime for, for collecting information on, on incidents here. So those are, uh, let's say, boundary conditions, if you will, that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that the industry would benefit from, from further developing. Yep. Uh, but other than that, I think the, 
yeah, the findings suggest there's simply uh, uh, a wealth of, uh, of experience out there with CO2 pipelines, mm -hmm. their operational performance, and that does not suggest there's, uh, there's specific uh, uh, challenges or so that, that would need to be addressed to, uh, to apply those for CCS projects. Yeah, so I guess in that situation the technology is there, but perhaps the main difficulty is actually about um, the, e the economics of investing in such large pipeline infrastructure and, and who would pay for that. Yes, that, that's certainly something that, uh, that needs to be considered. Also, if I, I may still add one more element, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the public concern topic that, that we, uh, we mentioned, uh, that where, where the uh, CO2 pipelines are still something new, uh, this will need dedicated attention and, and explanation about uh, proactive communication about this track record of CO2 pipelines and what or what that element of such a project is actually uh, about. Okay, here yeah. um, we also have another question about with a multiple source network. Um, where they're asking whether or not. Um, standardization is really required, but would it be possible to have a, maybe a cleaning point at a certain part of the network um, to standardize the CO2 and would that impact on the cost and efficiency? Doug, may I have yes. a question to you? Thank you. Yes, uh, there's, there's no question that uh, that kind of system would, uh, would work extremely well. Uh, it, 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 it very much depends on, on the commercial aspects of the thing, who owns what, and what is the, what is the optimum place to put that uh, cleanup situation. Uh, again, like a, like a natural gas field, uh, your, your sources of uh, CO2 may be different, and uh, you have a gas processing plant, and uh, then you get the, uh, shall we call it, the trunk line. Yeah, so that's, that's entirely possible. Oh, okay. And, and the, uh, um, Evelyn, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. One uh, consideration here that's also interesting that if you look at the, that these these existing networks that they developed mm -hmm. over time, right? So they probably started with uh, a single source or a small number of sources leading to a single mm -hmm. destination, and then over time new sources and destinations were added. Uh, yeah. And so such a such a cleaning point may be something that one would consider uh, not at the onset when the, the basic mm -hmm. quality criteria qualities are clear, but over time as new sources become available with different specs that need to be aligned, let's say, with what the pipeline can, can handle. Yeah, I guess with only a small network it initially made sense if there was just one producer and one um, where the CO2 needed to go to, to only have requirements that required least cost work. Um, another question we have here, it's about um, CO2 slurry. Um, it was, do you recommend um, going to CO2, a CO2 slurry pipeline, such as a sodium bicarbonate slurry? Um, could this be easier for handling with less corrosion and lower transmission pressure? Do you, uh, is there any experience in this area? Doug, so, could you, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the CO2 slurry one was actually something that SNC-Levelin uh, contributed to in terms of design and so on. Uh, we established, technically established the feasibility of, of slurrying in that case, I believe it was sulfur. Uh, but it, this is an economic proposition more than, than, than anything else. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure, I'm not privy to all of the information because we were a consultant to, to a client and it's their information. Uh, but the economics are pretty tough. Uh, that's probably going to be the limiting factor as opposed to any technical factor with slurrying, say, sodium, bi sodium bicarbonate. Worth looking at. Okay, and um, do you have any, is there any data in, available on the extent to which crass, crack arresters have been specified? Very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the answer is no that we can see. There is an understanding of the need for crack arresters. Uh, uh, the, the present uh, method of 
crack arresting is uh, simply to put a, every once in a while a joint of pipe in the pipeline that is of a greater uh, wall thickness. But there are some other uh, means of doing that that are being developed. Uh, uh, as, uh, unless it's specified in CSA Z662 or the B313 from the United States, uh, I am not aware of uh, anything specific. Uh, I, I'd have to take that under advisement and ask my technical team if there are specific provisions in uh, either of the specs that I'm aware of for, uh, for crack arresting. Okay. And in terms of um, standardization, um, how would you ensure a universal certification and verification process from companies like SGS and DNV? Is that um, me again? Yeah, well, that one not you, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the, uh, typically what happens in these cases is, uh, is, is more driven commercially uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what, uh, what kind of uh, standardization of, 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 uh, of, of specifications for the physical CO2 that goes into the system. Uh, and uh, and it will vary from network to network depending on where the network is going and what the characteristics of the uh, of the physical uh, the physical characteristics of the pipe system are. So I I can't answer the question. I'd be interested to hear what Ecofis has to say about the DNV uh, etc. connection. No, I, I'm afraid I don't have any uh, yeah specific specific thoughts on on that. Other than that, I'm wondering if this uh, is not a topic that where it really should be considered in a, a question in a similar way as one would do for, for natural gas pipelines. As a general rule, uh, unless you're using a natural CO2 source where the CO2 is darn near free. Uh, so it, 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 it's just not a big deal. Trajectory on costs, I think the costs are reasonably well established and are very much determined by the physical characteristics of where you have to go. Uh, and uh, and and also by the proximity to civilization, where you may have to get uh, a little, uh, well, perhaps a lot more uh, careful about uh, about perhaps how close together your uh, emergency shutdown valves are, so that the cost is driven up. Main issues are the physical surroundings, as far as cost is concerned. Well, maybe one one thing I can uh, chip in that that. It's clear that uh, a significant share of the uh, 6,000 plus kilometers of these pipelines in the U.S. is in uh, areas uh, with low to very low population densities. Uh, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, some of these pipelines also pass near or through uh, some more uh, yeah, densely populated areas. Uh, so where there's interesting lesson learned on, on the, uh, uh, the differences in, in terms of how to, uh, to plan in the end build these pipelines there. Uh, but probably not much different, or not different at all, from uh, from natural gas pipelines. Okay, and here we have a question about what the report includes. It asks if the re um, report includes information or examples on pipeline op operation, um, for example, the variation in pipeline conditions, pressure versus capacity, um, when CO2 has been used with EOR. Um, yeah, there is some information on this in, in the report and uh, building on, on slightly more de detailed information in the, uh, in the database. Uh, but it is important to realize that, that yes, all the detailed operational characteristics uh, are often considered uh, uh, confidential. Uh, hence, there, there's limits to how far we got in, uh, in, in acquiring data there or the parties were, data that parties were willing to share. Uh, could I add something to that? Uh, the, the, the characteristics uh, become perhaps a little more standard than they do in some of the other situations because of the drive to go to supercritical for long distance uh, 
uh, CO2 pipelining. And also, uh, most EOR projects for CO2 are quite deep. So you require and can use uh, supercritical CO2 in a miscible flood uh, so that it mixes with the oil uh, at, at deep formations. So, so it, it, it can be a little more standard than it is for either oil or gas pipelines. Okay, um, were there any other um, more general findings from projects that had um, insufficient data for the data base that gave other um, interesting learning points? Um, well, let's... Um, I, I would say no, but that's because whenever we encountered interesting information, we have made sure it was included in the database. And mm -hmm. this has led to, in some cases, adding projects to the uh, initial uh, slightly smaller number of projects that we plan to, uh, plan to include, um, that, but that we decided to include because of, in some part, there was interesting information. Uh, Maybe could you give us an example of this instance? I, Qatar. Yeah, that's uh, the project in Qatar. I would have to look through the list, which I don't have. <laughs> Sorry. Now right in front of me, but um, I think that will be pretty clear if you if you look in the digital to database. Sure. Frank, you, may, you, Frank, you may want to talk about uh, some of the things I found interesting in the European situation. Is, is, is all of the soft issues. Uh, they came as a bit of a surprise to me. In North America, we don't seem to have quite the same amount of trouble with uh, with the pipelines, uh, at least up to the present. No, so maybe that that's overall interesting, uh, uh, an interesting finding, let's say, where I think it was very uh, good and productive to work together in this project with uh, us as here, a partner in Europe with the SNC in, in, in the core expertise in, in the Americas, uh, okay. to, to include these different perspectives yeah. What, what, Doug, did you just want to reiterate what you meant by soft findings? Did you mean like um, uh, public concern and communication issues? That's exactly what I meant. Yeah, okay. Now, definitely a different situation in Europe as to find in the Americas. Um, and, 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 and there's, it's also interesting to contemplate the reasons for that. Uh, one obviously uh, has to do with the familiarity with these uh, projects and them having been in, in operation in the U.S. for, for a number of years mm -hmm. already. Uh, population density, density also certainly plays a role uh, with this. Uh, so, so there's and then regulatory regime that is established uh, uh, over there where it's much less developed uh, here. So there's a number of, of reasons behind that. Yeah, definitely a big issue, uh, not a big issue, but an interesting issue there. Um, well, that's about all we have time for today. Um, did you have any final remarks, or shall we can ra almost wrap it up now? Well, I would like to thank uh, the participants for, uh, for attending this, uh, this webinar, and I'd like to thank the uh, Global CCS Institute for, for making this possible, as well as uh, IEA GAG. Uh, and Evelyn, I would like to thank you personally for, uh, for hosting the event. Uh, our pleasure. Um, so I'd like to let all the listeners know that this presentation will be made available on our website in the near future. And you can go to the webinar page under the Get, Get Involved tab. At the Institute, we regularly hold webinars on a diverse range of topics, so please stay tuned. Um, and if you have any feedback on this webinar, or any other topics, please let us know. We'd, we'd welcome hearing from you. Also, following the close of this webinar, there'll be a short survey, and we appreciate the time you take in filling it in. Again, thank you all for listening in and contributing uh, your questions today. We had an interesting discussion, and that's all thanks to, to the presenters and to you for um, contributing wherever you are around the world. Again, I would also like to thank our presenter, Frank, and our other panel members, Paul and Doug. Goodbye for now. <laughs>